I am the son of a very violent, tyrannic father, an officer in the army, and a very cold and aloof mother who was not affectionate. So it was not, my mother was not a person that I could go to, ref, to find refuge. So because she didn't want to be touched. So, I mean, you get a kid that grows with that couple. That, and I didn't know at the time as a child that you necessarily don't have to love a couple of parents, a couple of mother and father that don't show you affection and love. So I always felt guilty that I couldn't love them because I thought that the parents of all the other boys and girls were like my parents. It was a fucking hell, okay? Before Batista was another dictator worse than Batista. So, um, so when Batista put him in jail, my father tried to commit suicide with a ice pick and uh, so after he, he went to the hospital after that they put him into a, a clinic for for nervous problems and uh, and he stayed there for five years but I, I had already I was born six months before. I born three, three, ninety, three, three, thirty-three. And, uh, and my father was sent to jail the 12th of August of 1933, so I was six years old, no? And, uh, but when I was about four, they started taking me to visit him in the clinic. I didn't know who he was, uh, so uh, my mother said, always oh, give a kiss to Papi, and I saw this man came out of a bungalow with dark glasses, and, and, uh, and she said, give a kiss to Papi, so I gave, a, I gave a kiss to this unknown person that I didn't know. So, and my mother said, told the governess to take me to see the monkeys and the papagalli, you know. And, uh, and probably putting together the monkeys and the papagalli, one moves a lot and the other one talks a lot, probably unconsciously I became an actor, part papagallo and part monkey. When it was, uh, when my father was discharged from the clinic, my aunt gave him his, uh, her, her uh, casa de campaña, her farm, to start a life of a civil, civilian person. And uh, all the friends and family gave him a couple of each animal, like uh, uh, a hen and a rooster, and uh, a male and female of many things, like pigs and horses and whatever. And he uh, collected some money and bought a little Ford uh, of 1938, you know, the, the Ford, the, those little cars that look like uh, the Donald Duck. He got it at a very good price, so the windows were not there. And in the back it was like a little balcony that my little sister and I loved to sit in as kids, we were little, and to go from the farm to, to the city to visit our grandparents, our cousins, and etc. And I remember one day a, a very vivid memory that I have of Cuba is the smell, the smell of the earth after raining, because it started pouring rain and we were soaking wet my sister, who was very chubby, 
had a big, how do you say, lasso, I don't know how you call it, a bow, oh. that, that's it. Okay, so the bow with the rain just <laughs> fell down and she, was, <laughs> she had the, the legs of the bow hanging in her face and she started crying and screaming because she wanted to look pretty. And mommy, mommy, my bow, my bow. Blah, blah, blah. So anyway, it was tragic, tragic. Uh, coming from that farm. Um, by the way, in that little Ford, I always went with my father to look for the rest of the food of the rest of the family and friends. So we had to put, I went down with him to get all this monetza, all this rest of rotten food, and put it in the little car to go to the farm to feed the pigs. And we were smelling and so. I was a child and that was, my father made me wake up at four in the morning and uh, you know, he, he was like, if I was his, his, the army of one little soldier. So, and he just wanted me to, to be like a, like a soldier. And I was four, so. Anyway, when, we, when I was six, it was time to go to school. And I went to the Salesian, uh, La Salle, La Salle, the Salesian brothers. Catholic school, and uh, and it happened that Batista was in power, and uh, after he had to, but Batista was in power, and I happened to be the companion of my bench, of my seat in the class, the companion of Batista's son, Papo Batista. And I was very happy. I was sitting beside the son of the president. I was a child. I was six. So I was very, I couldn't wait to arrive home and said, and said, you know who my, my companion in the, in the bench is? Who? He said, Papa Batista, the son of the president. My father just beat the shit out of me and um, telling me that I couldn't be a friend of that the son of that bastard. So I grew up like that, and when I was uh, 17, I started uh, being a rebel without knowing that I was a rebel. So, and the only value, my grandfather was very rich. So for me, the, uh, the goal in life was to make money and to have everything that money brings. Uh, so uh, I decided, I went to the movies once and I saw East of Eden with James Dean, a movie directed by Elia Kazan and uh, uh, James D uh, Raymond Massey was playing the father, the tyrant. Jimmy Dean was playing the misunderstood boy, and Dick Davalos, his brother, was the one that was loved by the father. And the father would say, I don't know why you are not like him, you know, so putting him down all the time. So anyway, and then I started walking home. It was at night. I was like 19 at the time, and I started thinking, of the movie that I just saw, of the character that Jimmy did. And uh, his name was Caleb. And I thought, how strange, because Caleb is like Cain. And the good brother was, you know, like Abe, Cain and Abel, the bad and the good. So uh, the boy decided, the character, Jimmy's character decided to, he, hiding from his father to, to plant beans, and it was the war. And the, the price of the beans went very high. 
when it was the time to make the collection of the beans and sell it, he made a lot of money. And in one paper bag, he just fitted up with bills and, uh, and went to offer it to his father. The father, instead of saying, thank you, I mean, blah, 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 accused the character, Jimmy's character, Caleb, to have stolen the money. So, and said, you're punishing him again, give that money to whoever belongs to. So I said, oh fuck, I mean, so, but if, in me, it was like a click. And uh, I identify with that character that Jimmy played. And then while I was walking home, I thought, why can't I do that to become an actor? Because I never thought of being an actor. Uh, so what did I do? I started reading everything that James Dean did to become an actor. Then I, for the first time, I read that a sick existed a place called the Actor's Studio, where Jimmy's story, where Marlon Brando's story, where Montgomery Cliff's story, the best actors alive in America, were members of the Actor's Studio. So um, I decided that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to renounce to everything. I left Cuba the 5th of January, 1956. And Fidel Castro was in already preparing his revolution to change the status quo in Cuba. And, uh, and in a certain sense, I left because I wanted to do my own revolution not as the grandson of a millionaire, but as a, as a poor bastard. So, but that was the advice that a very rich aunt of mine gave me because she was the only person I told that I wanted to be an actor. I have the, the fama, the fame of being a rebel, crazy, Terrible guy. Anyway, not terrible, you know, pathetic in a certain sense. I have all the reasons in the world to be that. So, so I went to see this aunt of mine, the most in, an intellectual lady, very rich, and I knew she was going to understand me. And I said, Carmita, I've just, I'm coming to you. You are the only person I'm going to say that I want to become an actor. So she said, I believe you. I believe you. You're crazy enough to s select being an actor. But anyway, I w if you really want it, you, uh, I will help you with the ticket, just one way ticket, because you say you are going already to the American embassy to do your papers and, th and things. So, but she said, character are you going to play? The playboy that gets up at 12 in the afternoon, goes to the country club, to the yacht club, takes the bath till 2. At 2 you had lunch at the club, then you change your clothing at the club to go to the bar and start getting drinks to, to pick up the nicest girl that you can get out with with a group of people, and then go to a, night, to a restaurant, then to go from the restaurant to a nightclub, then from the nightclub to leave your girlfriend, the girls at home, and then you go to horror houses, and then to have breakfast in another restaurant, then to sleep and get up at the next day, and like that, like that, like that. She said, my son, I mean, hijo mio, but what a boring movie. So do you know, I mean, if you want to do this business, you have to be, you have to know what a poor man has to do to bring bread to the table and feed his children. 
and if you're going to do this, I'm going to pay you the trip to America, but you're going to start and you're going to learn. I'm not going to pay you your living expenses. You will pay that cleaning the floor, wiping the asses of sick people at the hospital, so and doing everything that a, a, a common man does to feed his family. And I was shocked because I never thought, it sounds terrible, but I never thought of poor people because I have never met, uh, being, I never knew what to be poor was. And uh, I was a privileged jerk. So she helped me on the 5th of, this, of, the 5th of January 1956, I took a plane and came to Miami. Here in Miami, um, oh, and she paid me the English lessons at the University of Miami, that thing she did pay. And, uh, and I kept reading about well, what you have to do to uh, Jimmy's life and other actors, Marlon Brando, what did they do to become actors? And they came out always this actor studio. There was a place that you just pay with talent, because from three thousand auditions that, from auditioners, that did try to become members, they took one, two, or th maximum three. So I started doing my English classes, and I was it was a class that me that spoke Spanish and wanted to learn English, had to speak English and tried the other person that wanted to learn Spanish, who had to, to speak Spanish to me. So using mime and the whole thing, at a, at a certain moment I realized she told me that she was in the actors, uh, the actors, the acting school at the university. And she said, by the way, we are looking for a Latino boy to, pl to play the lead in a play called Fishman Without a Boat. So why don't you come and audition for the director? And so and I said, well, and, uh, and there were other people there. And I said, well, the reason I came to America is because I want to go to the actor's studio. Everybody started kind of giggling at me. I said, this, this kind of Indian coming from Cuba I wants to become, go to the actor's studio. He doesn't even speak English. So anyway, they got me. And the play was going to be in Spanish, by the way. When I saw the poster, I said, Fishman without a boat with Thomas Million. <laughs> I said, oh my God, then it's true. I mean, I am in a fucking poster. So I decided, so you know what? I am losing, I am losing time here. I'm not going to even do the play. I'm gonna get the little money that I have, get a Greyhound bus and go to New York and go to this famous actor studio to see what I have to do to get in there. And I did. And I left them. I don't know what happened because I, I just, you know, the rear the boat didn't have the fisherman because the fisherman was already in a, in a bus. Anyway, going away. So the first thing I did was to leave my bag in a place that I had the address of some Puerto Rican people to rent a room. They gave me the room. I paid in advance. And the first thing I did was go to the actor studio. But I was very emotional, I, and I was terrified of getting in. I said, maybe I'm going to see Marlon Brando and Elia Gazan, you know, I mean. So anyway, and I sat in a brownstone stairs in f right across the street to look at the actor's studio, dreaming about really seeing Marlon Brando coming out. I said, oh, hi, Tomas. Hi, Marlon. How are you? Oh, Mr. Kazan. Yeah. Daydreaming. So I got the courage, went to the door opened the door. It was full of people, 
famous actress and da da da. And I went to a table where there was a blonde lady there. And I said, what do I have to do to study here? And she said, first of all, learn English and speak English. You, you don't speak English enough to be a member of the actor's studio. And then we really, this is, this is not a school. So this is like a laboratory where famous and already known actors and actresses come to try to do things that they are weak in. So it's like a, like a laboratory. So you pay with talent here. You don't have to pay money. So that's why we are so picky. In other words, I left very depressed. And I had to find a job. And I got a job in a, as an elevator operator in the Presbyterian Hospital of New York. And they gave me my uniform. It was a gray pair of pants, twice my size, uh, you know. And, uh, and uh, a tight little jacket belonging to somebody very thin. So I inherited the uniform, the little bow tie, and the kind of a general hat. My father would have been very proud to see me dressed like that, even if I looked like a fucking clown, but it was a very military clown. So I did that job, and when I was standing beside the door, waiting for the people that, that I was supposed to take off or down, I was thinking about, and I was seeing myself in the mirror in the wall across the hall. And I just looked so ridiculous, and I said, my God, I am completely crazy. I mean, look where I am. And I left a, a life of privileges, etc. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to join the Navy because as I came as a, as a resident, I was supposed to go to the Army to serve in the, in the Army. So but I thought that I was going to go with a bunch of Latinos, so I was not going to learn English. That, so I will use those years to learn English as I, if I am going to English school. So I apply for citizenship to be able to get into the Navy. Because in the Army, you could not apply for citizenship. But in the Navy, yes. So they sent me to Bembridge, Maryland, and I started doing boot camp there. I mean, I realized, I said, but let's take it easy and think I'm doing a movie. This is like a movie, you know? I am in a barrack with all my, uh, you know, fellow sailors. They're all Americans, I am a Latino. So I might be the Latino, you know, like Abbott and Costello, in a, in a, you know, at the Navy, and I am like Carlos Ramirez with the Maracas, you know? Anyway, so I justify in that way to make it easier for me. And they thought I was very funny. For example, at dinner, they asked me, uh, amigo, they call me amigo. Amigo, do, do you walk comfortable with shoes? I said, yeah. I said, but in your country, do they know what shoes are? And, and where is Cuba? I said, well, it's an island in the Caribbean. I said, ah, do they have ice cream there? Ah, uh, was, you know, so disgusting. Anyway, one day I got sick with uh, kidney stones, and I lost my company. So when I left the hospital, I, all my friends, the company that I was in, graduated, and I still had to go in a different company with different people. I said, no, I'm in Navy. I forget about Navy number two because too much for me. So I have to do something to get the fuck out of here. 
So what I did was I started doing exercises uh, at 3 in the morning, getting up from the barrack, going out, and taking my shirt off, and doing push-ups in the snow so I could get a cold. After I got the cold, I wouldn't say anything, and I would continue to exercise and run with the company till I got a level of fever that if I, I was going to try my first acting scene. And, but I had to arrive to the level of uh, fever that I wouldn't give a shit if they found out that I was, you know, playing a part. So I did that. I had a hundred and three of fever and I finally said it. They took me to the hospital, they gave me a cold shower so the fever could go down. <clears throat> and when the sergeant was bringing me a tray with a tea, hot tea, and some aspirin, I suppose, for the fever to go down, I said, now this is the moment I'm going to play crazy. So I, pa hit the tray and the whole cop and the whole thing went on top of the sergeant and he said, just a crazy guy <laughs> could have done this. So I said, I, I need an analyst, I need an analyst and, uh, and tonight I want to be, uh, I need a nurse with, and I described my mother with black hair and blue eyes and uh, because I have many things to confess to her. They took the nurse with black hair and blue eyes, and I took her hand, and I, and I started playing that she was my mother. I said, Mommy, I just want to confess something to you. I hate uniforms, and if they keep me here in this place, I'm going to kill myself like my father did. And then I could send, like that, I could send her $10,000 of insurance. At least I'd do something for her. And uh, anyway, when the fever went down, as I said, I need, uh, what I need, I need to talk to a doctor, to a, an analyst. Because if I stay here, I'm going to kill myself, I said. So they um, decided to put me in a ward under observation. And they did everything they could to provoke me, to see how I was going to react. And I knew they were provoking me. And when I said, I'm thirsty, I need some water, one guard said to the other guy, oh, the wise guy is thirsty. Mm -hmm. I said, listen, if you ask for water again, we're going to put you in isolation at the dungeon down here. So I just played cool. After 15 days, they got the, the captain, the general, the whatever, to decide what was my situation. If I could stay in the, in the Navy or send me away with a medical discharge. So I said, uh, after 15 days, they say, uh, Tomas, uh, we have studied your case. You're perfectly able to be in the United States Navy, but nobody obliges you. What do you prefer? To serve the United States of America and the United States Army? or be a free citizen. Say, I'm sorry, but I want to be a free citizen. Cut. Good luck. Y me fui. Went back to New York. Then I said, this is the time I'm going to apply for the actor's studio. I apply. When I left the actor's studio that night, I saw, I mean, they're not going to get me. Imagine a Cuban with an accent, blah, 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 forget it. Two days later, I got a postcard saying that I passed the preliminary exam. And the next day, they called me from the actor's studio. 
Martha was her name, and she called me Tommy in a friendly way. Tommy, I am Elia Gazan's secretary. I have a very good Christmas present for you. You have been accepted to the actor's studio, and the first class will be the 8th of January, 1958. Congratulations. One day, I got a call from an agent in New York. Her name was Jane Daisy. That people in the studio have spoken to her of how good this Cuban boy was at the actor's studio. And, uh, and at the, in the meantime, I was doing a play off Broadway that a writer, a one act play, a writer wrote for me. And, uh, and she went to see me, I didn't know, but I knew after when she called me. I went to her office and when I sat there, I saw a, f a silver frame and I looked at it and it was Jimmy's picture. And he said to mother, Jimmy. I said, how come? He said, well, he was my client and friend. And I happened to be there, so it was really very kind of magical thing. One day, Jane calls me, uh, to tell me that Giancarlo Menotti, an opera composer, was auditioning for an opera, but for the part of, a, of the assistant of the medium. The name was the medium. So the medium beat him up, etc. And he was his, his kind of servant. And, I, and the thing was going to be shot for in television by CBS, I think. And the whole America was going to see it. I didn't think that it was an opera, a modern opera that people probably were not going to see it. It was going to see a modern opera from the public, the general public. So that's for an elite, and the elite is always very limited. So, but anyway, I just wanted to do that part. Uh, I went to the... Uh, I went to the Carnegie Hall where they were auditioning, and uh, and I was staying with a with a lady, very rich lady, who was, you know, kind of feeding me and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I was looking. I was very thin and with shadows under my eyes. And I said to her, I said, "Do you have something that is not makeup?" but that I could put on my face, that I look a little suntan. Oh, yeah, she said, oh yeah, I have this liquid called Tan in a Minute by Helen Rubinstein. I said, what do I have to do? She gave me the bottle. I said, what do I have to do here? And she said, just pour it in your hands, do like this and just pour it in your, <laughs> oh, mamma mia, in your face. So I did it, not knowing that when I got into the Carnegie Hall, where they had neon lights, I was totally orange with white things like, and I looked like an Indian Sioux before assaulting the train. So anyway, it was pathetic. There were about 30 young guys there, and I remained with the Puerto Rican shorter guy. And uh, Menotti said, Mr. Million, do you look as well built as you look on the stage? And I thought I was going to help myself, saying, yeah. He said, well, you saw me. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. And she said, what a pity. I said, what do you mean, what a pity? He said, yes, because you see, the medium have to beat up the boy. And if the boy is strong as you are and tall as you are, the medium just punched the boy, and that's the end of the, of the opera. So, and I left very depressed. Da, da, da. So when I went home, I called Jane and I said, where is Mr. Menotti? Where does he live? He said, he's staying at the Warwick Hotel. What is the phone number? Well, look in the, in the so found the number, 
call and and I hear, hello, it's a Mr. Menotti, please. Is that speaking? It's a Mr. Menotti, my name is Thomas Millian. I am the actor of the actor studio that auditioned. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. I said, Mr. Menotti, please give me the part. I'm going to play the best Toby you have ever heard. No, not heard, because he was deaf and dumb. So, <laughs> that you have ever seen. So, selling myself. So he said, oh, but what a pity, because I gave the part to the, to the shorter boy. And he said, well, but I have an idea, I have an idea. I have an idea. What are you doing tonight at 7.30? Say, I'm free. So I said, okay, I wait for you at 7.30. I told Marsha, the girl, I said, I'm seeing Giancarlo Menotti at 7.30 tonight at his hotel. Probably he's going to give me a part. So, so anyway, I arrived there and I see kind of a, there was Leonard Bernstein sitting there. It was uh, Samuel Barber, the author of Concerto for Violin, you know, beautiful piece. And uh, an accountess from Rome. <coughs> And I was like in the middle, they didn't tell me to sit down. I was standing there like in the pista of a circus, of this very aristocratic artistic circus. And, and Menotti, who had noticed that I was, oh, I, have, I had washed my, cell, my face in the meantime. So then he said in front of everybody, he said, dear boy, you are a very good looking young man, but why do you have to, what do you need to put makeup on? God, I felt my ears, I felt that I became red as a semaphore, as a, as a red light. And I said, you know why? Because I was trying, well, I said, forget about it. I get out and slam the door. I went to the, to the elevator. And I heard, Psst. I looked at it. I went, I said, what should I do? Should I go back or, or have dignity? I said, what a fuck dignity. You don't have to have dignity to become an actor. So Psst. I went back. He said goodbye to everybody. That kind of was a kind of giggling. Da, da, da. I got in, he made me sit in the sofa. He sat beside me in the sofa, and he said, oh, I said, but what's the problem with you, dear boy? First you insult me, and then, and then I felt he was really human, and I started crying, sobbing like a jerk. I said, well, I don't understand you. First you offend me, now you cry. I said, what's wrong? So I said, oh, because I don't want people to, because, you know, uh, to get confused about me. And I want to be appreciated by my talent, not for what I look like. So uh, he said, well, listen, I have an idea. I have at the festival a pantomime by Jean Cocteau. I said, but I don't speak Italian. He said, well, you don't have to speak. It's a pantomime. Oh, oh. and I have, do you know how, to, are you a mime? I said, well, I have studied with uh, Jean de, uh, Etienne de Cru, who was Marcel Marceau's uh, teacher. But from there, being a professional mime, you know. I said, well, it doesn't matter. You know how to dance. You have rhythm. I said, oh, yeah, I, I'm Cuban, so anyway. They put me in a plane, took me to Spoleto, and uh, I practiced. And every, and the day of the opening, I was, uh, no, no, now I have to tell you about the, the thing. Anyway, I felt, I had an accident, I fell into the Oscar, Oscar orchestra pit, and opened my arm, it gave me 28 stitches. And the, the doctor said I couldn't do the opening, it was the next, uh, the next day. 
because the guy that was supposed to hold me from here when I was going to jump from the stage towards the public, like if I'm going to, you know, the guys in Acapulco that throw themselves in the water. So making believe I was going to jump. The guy over here who was a professional of mine from the Scala de Milan hated my guts because I was not a professional of mine and I was the star of the thing. So and he let me go. I said, I have to do this to, tomorrow night. So in a rush, I kind of fixed the end so I didn't have to do a jump through a window that I was supposed to do that was really dangerous for my arm. And that the only chance I had was to ask Menotti to please, if he could call um, Cocteau, and ask him for his permission if he allows me to do the way is not dangerous for me. So uh, he called Paris, Cocteau, and he said, oh yeah, tell him to do it. It's more Cocteau the way he did it than the way I did it. Then from there, uh, everybody talked about this Cuban boy, very good looking that did this, uh, Cocteau and Spoleto, and the story of the arm, and, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to Rome just to get, to stay there for a little while, see a little bit about Rome, and then go to America, go back to America. And that, because that was the reason I left Cuba, just to do uh, my craft in America. I'm not, so, but a director called me, who saw me at, in Spoleto, I said he had a movie, he was going to direct a movie called La Notte Brava, and he thought that I was perfect, one of the leads. And I said, but I don't speak Italian. And he said, well, we, we dub here. And that sounded not, not nice for me. I said, you mean somebody else talks on top of me? Say yes, but that's the way we do it here. Ah, no way. So I said, I, I don't think so, I'm sorry. So well, think about it, think about it. So I went to a friend of mine, Menotti's secretary, and I said, Earl, they're offering me a movie and they're giving me a lot of money, but uh, they're gonna dub me. Tomas, what do you care? You have lots of debts in New York. Get, do the movie, get the fucking money, go to back to New York and pay your debts, including the ones you have with me. So, at the, I owe my career to debts. I did La Notte Brava, and everybody talked about me after La Notte Brava. And I was about to come back to New York, to America, and uh, Bolognini again offered me the second movie, El Bello Antonio, con Mastroianni, Claudia Cardinale. And I play El Bello Antonio's uh, uh, cousin. And uh, Bolognini thought that to put glasses on me so I wouldn't look bello like the Bello Antonio that was Mastroianni. So, so he put glasses on me because in those days having glasses meant to be ugly, I don't know. So, but everybody noticed me again in a different type of part. And I was about to go, but Claudia Cardinale told me in Sicily where we were shooting that there was a, a, direct, a producer in, it, in Rome that wanted to sign me for a five-year contract. I said, no, no, I can't because I have to go back to America to do my... So, but the producer, Cristaldi, um, spoke with an agent. The agent called me, told me who, how much they were going to give me. It was a lot of money for the first year, more money the second year, more, even more the third year like that. It was really a lot at the fifth year. So, and I couldn't say no to that. 
But I knew that was going to change my destiny, that my life was going to change radically. But I said, no, but when it's time, I go back. In the meantime, at the building that I was living, I met Rita, my wife. We married. She gave me a son. The contract ended, and then I was on my own. And uh, the Western movies, I, oh, with Cristaldi in that contract, I did lots of intellectual movies. And I became known as an intellectual actor, very good, but intellectual actor. Um, I did a movie with Visconti, Boccaccio 70, and uh, with the top directors in Italy. So after that, the Westerns uh, were in fashion. And I said, I have to do a Western because I want to arrive to the common people. And I remember my aunt when she said, the common man, that I had to have the experiences of a common man. And that was a way, it was, the character was um, uh, a bandit. Uh, you know, those bandits in the Western, it was a Spanish-Italian co-production. Those bandits in the Western that served the bounty killer to, to shoot him like a, like a rabbit. So I play this bastard, a mean guy. The movie was very successful. And that meant that they asked me to do the big gun down. La Reza de Conte, with Lee Van Cleef. But let me tell you something about the Westerns in America. I, says, I know that many directors and producers, American producers and American directors, went to Italy to really find out why the Westerns that they call, in a very kind of, to put, them, to put the, the Italian Westerns down, they call it spaghetti Westerns. I mean, come on, give me a break. I mean, and Sam Peckinpah and all those di American directors, when they saw the Italian wester Westerns, that they used a lot of violence, actual violence, they st started doing it here. So they learned from the Italians how to do a new type of Westerns. Well, I mean, we noticed, first of all, that the Westerns were finishing. So, and that we have to find something to substitute them. And one of the first, it was done by me. As a matter of fact, um, I said the only thing, that the only difference in between the Polizieski and Westerns is the electric light. And the motorcycle substitute, substituting the, uh, the horses and the cars substituting the stagecoaches. Then came Monnezza. Uh, Monnezza started in a movie called El Truci de los Birro. He was a thief. But I had, as he was with Lenzi, and Lenzi gave me a lot of space, I first invented the character and uh, I wanted him to be kind of uh, kind of nice looking, but not looking in, in a beautiful kind of good looking way. No, no, um, agreeable uh, physique. So I make him rounder, like a, because let's say compare it to a, like a spoon, because a spoon is always nicer than a knife. Uh, <clears throat> and I started with my head, with the wig and things, so become a rounder thing. Then um, the movie was very successful, and I started using four-letter words, making, uh, how do you say, uh, making rhyme, culo with mulo, uh, leña with freña, you know, terrible words in Spanish. So. Um, and that way of talking, and people loved it. 
loved it. So, and it became a very famous character in Italy. The young people, when it was like in the stadium when, to see a soccer or something, when they heard me saying those terrible things, they just started screaming like in the stadium, really. When you make in soccer, you make goal. Well, anyway, Monetza, Monetza. So we did about four or five movies with Monetza Thief. Then I went to New York to rest, and I went to see Serpico. Well, I see Serpico, this policeman, cool, with long hair and the beard and little funny hats and stuff. I said, oh, shit, I would love to do that in Italy. But he already did it. Pacino already did it. How can I do it with dignity? I mean, I don't like to imitate anybody. When I went back to Italy, uh, the producer and Bruno Corbucci, the director, came to my house and writer, he was a writer too, to offer me, and they, the way they used, they were to, to convince me to do it, he said, we, are, we like to do with you a movie like Serpico. So, I say, and I say to them, no, 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 no. If I do a movie the way you want to do a movie, I know what you mean. I said, let's do it in the sense that Monetza goes to the movies and sees Serpico, as I did see Serpico in New York. And he, as he is tired of being a thief, and he has a girlfriend, he thought, God, I mean, this is it before facts. This is what went into my mind. I, I said, I have to stop stealing. I have to get married, have a family, but I have to have a, a salary, a month. What can I do? I can become a policeman. So I go to the police and offer myself in the police academy, so, and I go out and, uh, then I will put my expertise, what I know, how the thieves work, et cetera, et cetera, to use it as a policeman to be able to get them. So I became a policeman and a policeman in a very, as he came from a very humble family and he was a thief, he, his duty is to get this thief. But I always kind of treat them in a kind of a, in a nice way knowing why you steal, because you don't have enough money to bring to your family, blah, blah, blah. So then, um, and I wanted to continue to call him Monetza, but Corbucci didn't want to. He said, no, because I, the script, I have, a, I work with Amendola, you know, Corbucci Amendola is a signature, the, so, and, and we want to name him Nico El Pirata, we don't want, him to have anything to do with Monetza. I let them say that. I said, it doesn't matter. At least me thinking about it is Monetza who goes and become a policeman, for me that's enough. And if the movie goes well and the public likes it, that's what is important. So I became a policeman. I kind of uh, invented the costume and the whole bit. Um, but Monetza has the, the, the curly hair round like this. So I made him cooler in the sense Monetza went to the, to the hair thing and just pulled the, and make it longer as, as he appears, Tony Marroni, as they call him in Germany. Um, and we started like that. But I said, I want a poster of Al Pacino in my bedroom a little mouse that I have in a little cage called Serpicino, Serpico, little Serpico. And, and openly, this guy has identified with the Serpico played by Al Pacino, the way he was dressed, blah, blah, blah. And that's how this thing started. And, uh, and it was a tremendous, huge success. So then I said in the first movie, he should get engaged with his girlfriend. Then the second movie, he should get married. The third movie, he should have a little child, blah, blah, blah. And like that, we went on for 14 movies. I had all of them a uh, uh, box office success. <laughs> Then 
Then I decided that's it. That's it. My, my, my staying in Italy for 40 years stops right here. And when I left Cuba, I wanted to make it in America. So I said, I will go to America and we start all over again. So I came back at 50 years old to America and I started with my pictures under my arm with the help of William Morris, I mean, you know, the best agents in the world. But they didn't have a fucking thing for me. I mean, I did it for them. So, and I, it was very, very painful to tell you the truth, to, to become an unknown. And I remember once, oh, this is something that happened. In the, the first thing I did in America, in, uh, in New York, was off Broadway, a play by two characters, an old man and his wife. She was an Afro-American lady, and she was a soul singer in real life. Very good actress, too. And uh, it was a scene where I was laying, I was dying. And my wife starts, she was sitting close to my bed, and she started crying a lullaby. Oh my God, it was like one of those Southern songs, very kind of uh, with pain. And sing, hearing that song with that voice, Monetza and all my success in Italy started passing through my mind. All the pain that I have gone through to make it till that, mo till that moment. And then the tears started stay in my eyes like this, like two little lakes. And I heard <laughs> the woman director sucked my tears. I'm like, how disgusting. But at the same way, she was a poet, a poet. It was a very poetic gesture. She was, it's like saying how much I appreciate that you feel it so deep. Oof, it was really get good pimples. So, um, uh, oh, and then from them, uh, ah, let me tell you the way that thing started. When she met me, how she met me. She wanted to do an audition to see if I could sing. But she had an appointment down downtown in New York. So she said, Tomas, if you don't mind, let's get a taxi together. Where are you going? This way? Blah, blah. I said, I go wherever you go. Then I get a taxi and go to my place. Okay. So in the car, sitting in the back, was driven by a Chinese guy. And I could see his slanted eyes in the rear view mirror. And, uh, and she said, do you know how to sing? I said, I, well, I think, can you carry a tune? I said, I think so. She said, sing something. What am I going to sing? I just said, I don't know, the Cuban anthem. So I started, al combate, correr, vaya mesa, you know, singing, not, louder, louder. People have to hear you the, screaming like crazy. Then I look at the rear mirror, and the Chinese eyes were kind of, instead of slanted, they were kind of vertical, <laughs> looking at me, like what's going on here in the back. So she said, you got the part. So I said, okay, stop. I went off. And that was my first thing from started all over again. And then I started enjoying. I forgot being, that I was famous. I forgot about it. I don't have the time to become well known in America. In the business, yes, they know I'm a good actor. But the public, I mean, now with uh, John Leguizamo in the movie Fogley, I play a, a, how do you say, a guerrilla guy that was with Fidel Castro and Sierra Maestra, with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. And I have long hair, and I am uh, John Leguizamo's grandfather. You cannot tell that guy is the colonel in traffic or is the father in Lost City. They'll never, I don't have the time to be known in America. As a human being, I am like, a, I can define myself as, a, you know, those studies of anatomy where you have the muscles and you can see every muscle with no skin. So that's the way, in a sense, my sensibility is like if I am not protected by skin, and even the wind, 
hurts me. Unfortunately, being an, a man that I've gone through so much, but being a man that feels every single fucking pain that could be. So, but I, sur I have survived. I'm 80 years old now, so I have overcome all that. And it has be I have transformed into sabiduria, in wisdom. It has transformed in wisdom. So, let's see till, till where I have to go. I'm very grateful for this admiration. Unfortunately, I cannot see you. So it's like I'm thinking a mass, like a huge heart that is there beating for me and um, that keeps my heart beating for you. <laughs>